Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that's on page 649 of the Bible, right down by your feet. I want to talk to you today about the happiest people on the earth. The happiest people. Come on. When you think about happy people, there's several things that come to mind. You know, when you think about somebody that's happy and what dictates their happiness, sometimes the people will say happiness is when everything's going my way. When it's all going well, it's all going my way, and there's no tribulation in my life, that's when I'm happy. But I'd say that's not all of what happiness is. What is happiness to you? What does that look like? Psalms chapter 33, verse 12 says this, happy, say happy. Happy, happy is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he has chosen to be his own possession. Happy, those people who serve the Lord, God says those are happy people. Psalm chapter 40, verse 4 says this, How happy is anyone, say anyone, anyone who has put his trust in the Lord. Happy is the one who puts their trust in the Lord and has not turned to the proud or to those who run after lies. Happiness. Last week I started a series called Made to Flourish. Made to Flourish, where when when someone is flourishing, they are thriving. They're flourishing, they're thriving, they're growing, they are happy. And there's many things we think of when we think about happiness. Sometimes it, it has to do with status and accomplishments because of who, where, I, where the status I have in society and what I've accomplished, now I'm happy. Uh, for other people, it's popularity. I'm popular, I have a group of people I'm popular with, I have a place to belong, that makes me happy. And for others, it's about performance and success. How am I showing up? That, that'll bring happiness to me. But those are really not good measurements to define happiness. I came across some statistics the other day that revealed a group of people that were much happier than others. One group that was way happier than everybody else. There was a group of people who had obtained some sort of societal education. They had got their education. Maybe they got their master's. They learned a lot. They felt really comfortable in society because of what they learned and knew. And they had a measure of happiness. Then there were some who had moved along through life and they had some finances and they, had, they felt steady and stable in the, in the area of finances and that is what they said made them happy. And then there were some who were like, hey, I've been in the right relationships and those made me happy. But there was a group of people that were 545% more happy than others and that's for those that were very happy in marriage. In other words, they de- described them as those who were flourishing in marriage. The ones that were flourishing were 545% greater than just those that were just married. They were were happy. They had a great sense of flourishing, that they had a thriving marriage. And listen, it's not easy to build a thriving marriage or a flourishing marriage. And, um, but I do have some good news. You know, the world wants to sow into you this message that marriage isn't for today and you're just going to wind up in divorce anyway. And, and we've heard this, this statistic for a long time about the amount of divorces that are taking place. Look at these stats from 1980 to 2021. Divorce is actually on the decline. Come on, that's really good news. That's great news that divorce is actually on the decline But the world is not telling you that message, are they? They're lying to you about a lot of stuff. Divorce is on the decline. But I do know that there are times where we're in relationships and in marriage that we do struggle. And uh, the the statistics kind of share this as well, that that those who are married, here's the reason why they struggle, and it's this word selfishness. Selfishness. And think about selfishness. I mean, it's, it's, this is the way I know how to do things. I'm just going to do it the way I know how to do it. And if it was wrong, why would I keep doing it the way I'm doing it? It seems right to me. But what seems right to me may not be what seems right to someone else. And so where do you find the middle ground on that? And when you stop being selfish in a marriage, you start thriving again. And here's the deal. They say it takes seven to ten years to stop being selfish in a marriage. I know I was 10, I probably was 10, 11, 12, and I'm still working on not being selfish in my marriage. But most of those divorces that do happen, they happen in the first seven years because people haven't learned to stop being selfish. And selfishness comes out in all kinds of ways and things that we wind up doing and things that happen where we, we all of a sudden stop choosing our spouse and we start choosing other things. 
Now, I've said it before that when somebody gets married, they could stand at an altar up here and two people could believe like this is the person I'm supposed to marry, this is what life is gonna look like and, and I can't wait to get married to this person. Nobody, when I ask them, hey, hey, are you thinking about getting a divorce? No, they're like, no, we're getting married. And when they're standing up here, two people say I do and they're both saying I do. They wanna enter into this marriage and unfortunately, and I know many of you have experienced this, unfortunately, somebody starts to say, I don't. They say, I don't with, my, with their attitudes, with their actions, with their words, all kinds, somewhere somebody chooses to say, I don't. And then, unfortunately, that marriage comes to an end. Now, let me say one more thing about divorce before I move on. Divorce, it, the Bible does say God hates divorce because of the effects of divorce and what that does to all of those that are involved when relationships that were meant to be in covenant get separated. But God does not hate people who went through divorce. He does not hate you. He loves you. He loves you. So as I talk about some of those th these things today, don't let condemnation hang over your head because somebody in your marriage said don't. Okay? Don't, don't let that happen today. But I do want to talk to you about flourishing marriages this morning and how, that listen, surviving is not just enough. That how you can thrive and learn how to live sacrificially and how to have a thriving, sacrificial, flourishing marriage. So all of you that are, um, you've been past that season of your life, some of you are widows or widowers, and, and um, you're gonna be like, oh, this message doesn't really apply, but there's some things you could help other people with as you learn today. Some of you are looking for a spouse, and there's some great things you can learn today as you're thinking about the day you're gonna be married. And so I just, hopefully this lays a foundation for you today, because I want to share some virtues, some behaviors, some outcomes of a flourishing marriage. And before we get to 1 Corinthians 7, I want to read out of Malachi chapter 2, and, and um, I don't even have this, I was going to show you just a piece of this, but I want to read a little more today, and uh, so it's not on the screen. So listen to this, Malachi chapter 2, in verse 13, says this, God is speaking to the children of Israel, and they're, they're, they're kind of messing up, they're not doing very good, and this is what he says, this is another thing you do. You are covering the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer respects your offerings or receives them gladly from your hands. These people are coming and they're praying and they're seeking God and they're moaning and they're weeping, but their sacrifice of prayer, their prayer really is being hindered. And in verse 14 it says, and you ask why? Why are my prayers being hindered? God, I'm here praying, why are they being hindered? And it says this, because even though the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, you have acted treacherously against her. In other words, you have not valued the covenant relationship of marriage, and because of that, your prayers are kind of like hitting the ceiling and not going through. And it says this, since she was your marriage partner and your wife by covenant, didn't God make them one and give them a portion of spirit? What is the one seeking? In other words, who is God seeking? godly offspring. So watch yourselves caref carefully that no one acts treacherously against the wife of his youth. Now here's what the Message Bible says in Malachi 2 verse 15. It says it this way. God, not you, made marriage. God made marriage. His spirit inhabits even the smallest details of marriage. The smallest details. His spirit inhabits them. And what does he want from marriage? This is what he wants, children of God. That's what. In marriage, what does he want? He wants you to be a fully reproduced child of God through marriage. That marriage actually is a way to help you grow as a child of God. It's to help you learn how to be more like him. So guard the spirit of marriage within you. It's interesting what, what uh, Mindy said earlier that you know, sometimes you can just have so much of the voice of what the world says about marriage. There's a spirit of marriage. There's a spirit against marriage. Do you know that since the beginning of time, the enemy has been against marriage? He's been against marriage from the beginning. It's the, it's the place where men show up the most passive and women show up the most pridefully independent. It's a nice word for controlling. Listen, it's in your nature it's sewn into marriage. Adam was standing right there 
when Eve went to eat of the forbidden fruit, and he never said, don't do that, we're not supposed to do this. He was passive. Some of the most successful men in this room can lead triumphantly in all areas of life, but yet be passive in their home. It's a curse against you that you have to break out of. Some women are the best servants in the world, but in their home they become controlling. Eve never stopped to ask Adam, should I eat of this fruit? And in that, sown into marriage, is passivity and prideful independence that wants to pull apart marriage instead of coming together. So here's the deal. Guard the spirit of marriage within you. And then it says, put that back up, Caitlin, don't cheat on your spouse. I'm going to talk about that in a minute and what that means. Here's three virtues of a flourishing couple, okay? Here's the first one, commitment. Commitment. Being committed in your marriage to the person that you've married. If you're going to get married one day, I want to tell you that commitment has to be the foundation of who you are. I'm making a commitment to this person. And we make these incredible pledges, these vows to each other when we get married. We say these things, richer and poorer, sickness and health. But when it comes, most people in the world go like this. They can't handle the richer, poorer, the sickness and health. And they split. But we make these vows that we don't really mean. And I want to tell you, commitment is a virtue in your marriage. Jesus says this in Matthew 19. He said, haven't you read that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female? That's how he created them, male and female. Those are the two ways God created mankind, male and female. No matter what the world's telling you today, male and female. And he also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. He'll go be with her, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Let no person separate what God has brought together. No man, no thing, no conflict, no disappointment will allow me to separate from my wife. That is my commitment. It's a decision to be committed that no matter what, I am going to stand with that person as long as I can. When you are committed, here's some things that happen when you're committed. When you're committed to your spouse, you begin focusing on their strengths instead of their weaknesses. You focus on their strengths. It is so easy to look at everybody's glaring weakness, right? It's so easy to see their weakness. But for us, whatever reason, we don't see ours very well. <laughs> You know, I, when I admit and realize, listen, I'm not perfect, I got a lot of weaknesses, that helps me realize, you know what, my wife's weaknesses aren't that big a deal. When I start focusing on her strengths, it allows me to love her, to focus on her strengths, not her weaknesses. Here's another thing that we can do. We can, when you, when you are committed, you encourage rather than criticize. The natural part that we like to do when we're selfish is we want to criticize. We want to tell that other person the way they don't measure up, the things they're doing wrong, how they're not doing it right, because they're not doing it my way. It has nothing to do with what God says, but my way. And so we become critical of our spouse. And so when we're committed to marriage, I'm going to learn how to be more encouraging and let criticism go to the back table I'm going to focus on their strengths, not their weaknesses. I'm also going to pray for my spouse instead of gossiping about them. Because when you're frustrated, when things aren't going right, and that selfish thing's kicking in, and you're not happy with what they're doing, you go to work, you go to your friends, and in that place, you begin to say things about your spouse that just aren't great. <laughs> they're not beneficial. And we start actually gossiping about them. And we actually start sowing bad seeds into other people. In other words, we start revealing flaws to people that never should know those flaws. They should never see that. That's the intimate part of a, a married relationship. When sin came into the world, what happened? Adam and Eve covered themselves. Before that, they were completely vulnerable. They saw it all. They were, all, they were flawed. They, they saw it all. But you know what? That's not designed for everybody to see. Sometimes your job is to protect your spouse. But in today's world, that's not the way we live. It's blast them. And listen, I just want to encourage you. When you think you can gossip about your spouse on social media and nobody knows you're gossiping about your spouse, we all know you're talking about your spouse. <laughs> and that's dishonoring. It's unloving. 
It's not kind. But I want to ask you this question. How often do you pray for your spouse? I mean, how often do you just stop in the middle of your, your day and pray for your spouse? When have you actually prayed for them? It's easy to be loose-lipped and gossip about them when we're frustrated, but have you stopped to pray for your spouse? God, I just want to pray for my wife today that you would protect her. God, I want to pray for my husband today that you would lead him into good things. God, I want to pray for my wife today that you would encourage her because she's been, she's been disappointed lately. God, I want to pray for my husband that you would protect him from the, the devices of the world that want to try to pull him away from me. When's the last time you prayed for your spouse? When you're committed to someone, you will find their strengths and you'll, you'll champion their strengths. You'll encourage them and you will pray for them. And you decide to learn how to love and treat your spouse according to Christ's standards. Some of you are really good. I mean, you treat me with so much kindness and so much grace. And I see you do it with other people as well. You love other people really well. But then when you go back into your home, you don't love your spouse, the person you should be the most committed to, in the way that you love so many other people in the world. To learn how to love with Christ's love, the first person you practice that on is your spouse. You practice it on with your spouse. So listen, don't cheat on your spouse by giving your commitment elsewhere. Don't cheat on your spouse by giving your commitment to other places. Sometimes wives cheat on their husbands by allowing their children to dictate their life and pull them away from their husbands. In other words, your children become a higher priority than your husband. Now, I listen, I understand children, they're young, they're, they're needy, they need a lot of attention, but they still can't be the number one seed in your heart outside of Jesus. It has to be God and then your spouse. And many times, going through counseling, we wind up in all kinds of problems because children went ahead of a spouse. Now listen, men, so many times you cheat on your wife by allowing work or hobbies to be up here above your spouse. We actually cheat on our commitment. We become more committed to our children or more committed to our work than we are to our spouse. And that is a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for disaster. So don't cheat on your spouse. Who and where is your first commitment? Really, where is it, if you're honest with yourself? Where's your level of commitment? That's the first thing. The second thing is this, is to have a virtue of being other-centered, or maybe a better, maybe I should have said it this way, spouse-centered. To be spouse-centered. Proverbs 3, verse 3 says this, Never let loyalty and faithfulness leave you. Tie them around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart. Never let loyalty and faithfulness. Think about the commitment and being centered on another person. If you're loyal and you're faithful, faithful, you're thinking about another person. You're spouse-centered. And think about it. It says this, tie it around your neck. What happens when you tie loyalty and faithfulness around your neck? You know, you ever put a leash on your dog and you tie him to a post or a tree? To keep them from running off, Right? Think about this, if loyalty and faithfulness are tied around your neck and they're anchored to your spouse, as you start to wander away, it will pull you back. It'll keep you from running away when your loyalty and your faithfulness is directed at your spouse. Be loyal and faithful. To be other-centered. Here's some things that happen when you're spouse-centered, when you're thinking about your husband or you're thinking about your wife more than you're thinking about yourself. Here's what happens. We, but marriage is actually intended to mirror God's covenant relationship with his people. Think about God's covenant relationship. God is loyal and he is faithful. And God loves his children. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God, in that relationship between himself and the bride... Marriage is a replica of that covenant. As we grow in our relationship with God, our marriage should actually reflect the nature of God. Now think about this. We shared about this a couple weeks ago. There's a couple pow powerful aspects of who God are that we actually could apply into our life. 
God, in his love, how he has loved us well, he displays mercy where we don't get what we deserve. He displays mercy where you don't get what you deserve. How many times in our relationship, what, what's it like to give mercy to your spouse? Where do you need to stop and give mercy? For most of us, we live in the punishment cycle. You did this, you deserved this, I'm shutting the bedroom door, you're not coming in. You did this, you deserve this, I'm no longer making you a sandwich. I'm gonna punish you for that weakness or that flaw because I don't like the way that treated me. Instead of having a conversation about it, we use the silent treatment, we use all kinds of things, and we isolate somebody out of punishment. What if, because you love your spouse and you're committed to them, you displayed mercy where you didn't give them what they deserved, but instead you gave them love? What if? What about if you did it like God in his love where he gives grace to us where we actually get what we don't deserve? We get salvation not because we deserve it. We get salvation. He gave it to us as a gift to be received. What if we actually extended grace to our spouse? What if we, what if we helped find mercy to, an ability to give them mercy and we extended grace to them? How would that display the marriage relationship? How would that also look like God's covenant relationship with us? How, would, how grateful and how powerful would that be when, in, when somebody's like, wow, you, you didn't take that out on your husband when that happened? And you're like, nope, I gave him mercy. What about your, your, your wife when she did that? Nope, I gave her grace. Why did you do that? Because God gave me grace. Because God gave me mercy. That's why I did that. Marriage mirrors the covenant relationship with God. Here's another reason about we should be other-centered or spouse-centered is because marriage is the firmest foundation for building a family. God created marriage as a loyal partnership between one man and one woman. That's how he created it. He created the male and female. Marriage is God's idea. And he said, I want you to have a loyal relationship between one man and one woman. Now listen, you know, all those people are going to point at the Old Testament and say, what about all these people that had multiple wives, blah, 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 blah. That was never God's design. Just because it happened didn't mean that was God saying yes to it. It's more of a historical reference than God saying, yes, you should do that. Marriage is the firmest foundation for building a family. When you are spouse-centered, you keep others out of your marriage. Gossiping to friends and coworkers or unhealthy attractions to other people. In displaying mercy and grace, you begin to show the heart of the Father to your family so they can see God at work in your lives and be the foundation of your family. So, we're designed to, marriage is supposed to be a foundation you can build on for your family. It's designed to reflect the covenant nature of God. Now, listen, I'm going to talk about something here that uh, some of you young people probably want to close your ears. God designed sexual expression to help married couples build intimacy. He designed sexual expression. Unfortunately, and listen, I know this is going to be difficult for a few of you. Unfortunately, because of sexual abuse, prior experiences, cohabitation, and pornography, they rob and continue to rob marriages of God's design for his healthy sexual expression. Sexual abuse and the trauma, the things that have gone through, people have gone through, that, that, that absolutely affects marriages today. Prior experiences that people have gone through absolutely affects marriages today. That's why God says you should abstain or wait until you get married, till you know this is the one. Not the one you assume is the one, but till you've made that commitment before God. Cohabitation, I mean, the world today tells you if you don't live together before you get married, you're foolish. But you want to know who has the highest divorce rate? Those that cohabitate. They have the highest divorce rate. It lacks commitment. You start with a way out by cohabitating versus making a commitment. And pornography is destroying the world in which we live. It's available at every corner. I mean, when I was a young man, I, pff, there's no way. I wasn't going to go to a gas station and buy a magazine. I feel so, it's, it's hard as a father of boys. Like, man, it's just in front of us everywhere. And it's become an accepted norm. 
that you'll read articles about it that'll say, absolutely, you should have some pornography in your marriage. Absolutely, you should have your own pornography. There's nothing wrong with that. And I want to tell you, it's doing nothing but bringing destruction into your marriage. It'll only destroy. It's why these things, though, all of these things, sexual abuse, past experiences, maybe a sin of cohabitation, and pornography, all of those things have to be brought to God so you can find healing. If you've never went to God to find healing for those things, if you've, you've never went to God and you said, you know, God, I actually want to apologize and ask you to forgive me for my sin of my prior sexual experiences, you're still going to be dragging those into your marriage. And you need to be healed of that. And then some of the most horrible things, some of the terrible trauma that some of you have been through, I know it's like I don't think I could ever give that to God. There's so many reasons why you wouldn't. I'm not going to go into all that today. But I want to give you hope. There are many, many, many people who have given that over to God and God has healed them from that and has redeemed that aspect in their life. Some people, though, we would like to use that as leverage in our life to not have any sexual expression in our marriage. Yeah, but remember that this thing that happened all those years ago, and we would rather live out of the past than out of what God has for us for today. Or we would hold against somebody the way their life was before you met them and their partners they had. And so in that, you find that information out and you push them away. And so sexual, sexual expression in marriage is actually being destroyed day by day. And I want to tell you, both men and women, listen, God can heal you, but you have to partner with him. Here's a couple things I was thinking about. For many, as I said, we use our past sexual experience as a weapon against our spouse. Many times because of fear, many times because it defines us and it gives an excuse not to connect in a healthy way with your spouse. For some, the guilt of your past sexual encounters and partners robs them of joy and fulfillment that God has intended for marriages to have. Guilt and shame continue to rob them because they have never truly repented to the Lord and gave them their past and for others, their unwillingness to admit and surrender their pornography use limits and destroys their ability to find the joy God intends for them in marriage. Pornography actually produces anger, isolation, and separation in your marriage, contrary to what the world is telling you over and over. Have you found 1 Corinthians chapter 7? I know, you're like, Mitch, can we just suck the air out of the room today? I know, it's, 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 listen, I'm not going to give you the answers for all the questions you have today, but I want to share with you some things that are godly, and I'm going to pray that God helps you sort a few of them out. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I want to read the first few verses here. The Apostle Paul is writing to those in Corinth, and their lives were kind of a train wreck and a mess, and he's saying, let me give you some, some guardrails, some guide rails, and some principles to live on that are godly. He says, now in response to the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to use a woman for sex. You shouldn't just use a woman for sex. It's not what you should be doing. But because sexual immorality is so common, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife. And each woman should have sexual relations with her own husband. A husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise a wife to her husband. God knows you are designed to have sexual needs. And he says, listen, if you have those needs, your spouse is supposed to, you guys are supposed to fulfill each other's needs. Verse four, a wife does not have the right to over her own body, but her husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but his wife does. Do not deprive one another except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, otherwise Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all people were as I am, but each has his own gift from God. One person has this gift and another has that. Verse 8, I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain as I am. But if they do not have self-control, they should marry, since it's better to marry than burn with desire. Flip to verse 32. I want you to be without concerns. The unmarried man is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But the married man is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. The unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord so that she may be holy in both in body and the spirit. But the married woman is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. I am saying this for your own benefit 
not to put a restraint on you, but to promote what is proper so that you may be devoted to the Lord without distraction. Flourishing marriages. Listen, that flourishing marriage thing, they're 545% happier than those that are not. I want to share a couple things with you here. Um, Here's the people, why they're flourishing. They have a great sexual life. And here's why they do. Here's why they do. It's as easy as this. They have regular date nights. They date each other. They actually care about each other. They've learned to love each other again. They also pool their income. They have healthy financial conversations and communication. And because of that, they don't allow that to be a separation between the two of them. And the best one is this, of all, those that have the best sex on the earth are those that have the shared faith, that have common faith. That those are believers and have submitted their lives to Christ together, they have better intimacy than anybody else in the world. All right, now listen. You are a three-part being. You are spirit, you are soul, and you are body. Your spirit, when you found Jesus, came alive. Your soul, we talked about it last week, is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your mind, how you think and process, your emotions, your feelings, how you feel, and the decisions that you make, your will. And you have a body, this flesh that you live in. Now listen, spirit, soul, and body, you are a three-part being, but if you're only connecting with your spouse in one or two of those areas, you are bored and dissatisfied with your spouse. If you're a great believer and you love God and you're connecting in the soul realm, but you don't connect with any physical intimacy, there's a 33% boredom factor that you have, and you actually have some needs that you'll go looking for others. Don't just tell your spouse they shouldn't have that need. Men and women both. I've had the testimony of both. Where men withhold from their wives and wives withhold from their, 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 their husbands. Both stories. If you have, but I also know people who connect physically and in the soul realm, but they have no spiritual connection, and they are bored in life, and they do not have a flourishing marriage. People who have a flourishing marriage are those that are connecting spiritually, in the soul realm, and in their physical being. Spirit, soul, and body. Physical intimacy is a connection point, and you have to choose physical connection in a world that's actually driving it apart. Now listen, here's what I'm going to tell you. It is not a demand You can't just demand physical intimacy. That's not it at all. It's a responsive and an understanding heart that moves towards someone and recognizes a need and they hear their hearts cry to say, I want to move towards you. It's not always a feeling. As a matter of fact, it's rarely a feeling. Maybe 75% of the time it's not a feeling because the timing and the emotions are never perfect. And I know people are waiting for the perfect timing and emotions, and they never connect physically with their spouse, and their spouse is struggling. I have these conversations all the time. And I'm not just talking about men. I'm talking about men and women where it is being withheld. And here's another thing. It's not, just, it's not a demand. It's not always a feeling. It's a decision to choose your spouse. Sex is not about me and my needs. That's what it was saying in 1 Corinthians 7. It's not about me. It's about serving my wife or my husband in an unselfish way. Now, I know you have to work through some things. You have to work through the past, all those things I talked about. You have to work through those. Otherwise, it's not going to be the picture-perfect thing God wants it to be. If, we're, if you'll protect yourself, it could be. Now, listen, I want to move this beyond just sex. For some of you, connecting spirit, soul, and body for some of you, when's the last time you, hold, you held your spouse's hand? There is something powerful that happens in physical connection. There, there is something that, that we need because God says we have become one. For some of you, you have not even held your spouse's hand because you have so much unforgiveness so much bitterness, so much strife, and if I hold his hand or hold, hold her hand, then she's going to think I want something more. Can you just hold their hand to hold their hand? When's the last time you sat by them on the couch just to sit by them? When's the last time you sat by, sat by them without, any, without somebody saying anything? You chose to just go sit by them and you just put your hand on their leg. You just sat by them and put your hand on their leg. When's the last time that 
you went, how many went, wives went, specifically, I don't know, wives or men, either one. When's the last time you saw your spouse and you just walked to, up to them and you just gave them a kiss? When's the last time you did that? We almost always, not always, a lot of the time, when I get home, I go find my wife, I hold her hand, I look her in the eyes, and I give her a kiss. That physical intimacy is necessary for a thriving relationship. And I know, I can see the pain on some of your eyes, some of your faces across the room. I know. Listen, I know you're disappointed. I know you're frustrated. I know there's been terrible things that have happened in some of your lives. But listen, i got to share this message because we've got to have stronger marriages. And you know who wants the, who, there's only one. When sin came in, what did they do? They covered themselves. What is the biggest struggle we have in our relationships is physical intimacy. From holding a hand to giving a kiss to just being there and holding someone to actually being intimate with them. Thank you. She could just stay up with me the rest of the time. I'd be fine. <laughs> My wife, listen, she knows when I'm stressed. When I'm stressed and she's seeing stuff come out of me that she doesn't like, instead of saying, Man, you're just being angry right now, or why are you being so frustrated, or why? She doesn't say that. She doesn't focus on my weaknesses. <laughs> she said she <laughs> said she used to. You know what she does? She comes and sits on my lap. When she sits on my lap, the, the house could burn down and I would be fine. Because <laughs> there is this completeness with my wife. She knows when I'm frustrated. She comes and finds me instead of running from me. When your spouse is maybe just a little loose, maybe go towards them. Husbands, your wife's kind of just nagging and complaining. And all. What if you just walked over to her and just grabbed her hand and said, hey, how are you doing today? Instead of saying, why are you nagging? Why are you complaining? Why are you? What if you just went over to her and said, hey, how are you doing today? Come on up, Abby. Listen, I know there's some things you got to get help from, but listen, don't cheat on your spouse by being self-centered. Don't cheat on your spouse by withholding your time, your treasure, and your talents. Don't cheat on your spouse. And the last one is this, is your compassion. Ephesians 4, verses 2, two, two and 3. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The first person you need to have the unity of the Spirit with is your spouse. And you do it by having compassion for them. When you're committed in your marriage and you're compassionate with them, you will spend meaningful time together. You'll spend time together. You will have date nights. You'll focus on each other. Maybe you need the 2 2 2 principle. Maybe having a date night every week is too much. But maybe you can do 2 2 2. Maybe every two weeks you go on a date. Every two months you have a night away. And I know this is hard when you have young kids to go have a night away. And maybe every two years you need to go spend a week together. Maybe you can do more than that. That's great. But maybe that's the least you could do. If you can't have a date night every two weeks, you've got to make an adjustment. Listen, I talked to a couple one time. They hadn't had a date in seven years because of their kids. Because they were afraid. They had a whole pile of friends that would watch their kids. But fear over, over their children kept them from letting someone else watch their kids. And you know what was robbed? Their marriage got robbed because of that. And it was a big unpiling because they went through seven years of not connecting with each other because they stopped dating. I'll share this with you real quick. The time that people come in for counseling the most is when there's two children, two or more children under the age of five. Why? Because they demand so much attention. And as a mom, you have this natural inclination to give them all that attention. And a husband is over here going, what about me? And then a husband, for whatever reason, he sometimes doesn't know what to do. So he's not helping the situation by helping with the kids. And he's just over there going, what about me? That's when you have the most, that's the time. Most, count, most people come to me when they have two or more in the home under five. Because it's stressful, right? They demand a lot of attention. The other time people come is when they have one left at home, especially if they had several kids, and they're on the verge of empty nesting or they are an empty nest. Because they had spent the previous 18, 25 years pouring in so much into their kids, they didn't date, they didn't go on vacations together, they didn't go do things, they, did all, they didn't do any of those things. And because they didn't do it, here they are 25 years later and they're looking at each other and going, I don't even know if I know you. 
because everything was about their kids. The commitment you make when you get married is to your spouse. Sometimes somebody has to recognize that this isn't working and I gotta provide some leadership. Somebody has to. We had had our third son. We were busy. We were broke. We couldn't afford to do anything. But I knew we needed a night away. We needed a weekend away. My son Josh was about eight months old. But, and I understand my wife, she wasn't, she, she, there was no way she could have made this commitment. But I did, because I knew I needed to lead. And sometimes you have to let your spouse lead. She didn't want me to lead, but I did. As far as she knew, we were going to go spend the weekend with my parents in, in Scribner. But we were in Omaha, and my my dad was driving us to the airport. And Melanie was like, she's, her radar was going off. This, we're not going the right way. What's going on here? What's happening? She said, what, what, where are we going? And I said, mom and dad are going to watch the kids. We're going to Chicago for the weekend. What? No, we can't do that. What, what do you mean? She said, well, have you bought airplane tickets? <laughs> Security going off, right? Have you done all this stuff? Now listen, this wouldn't have worked if I had failed miserably. I bought the tickets, set the money aside. I went in debt to go on this trip because it mattered more. It wasn't a lot of money, it was a little bit of money. Bought airplane tickets, got a hotel. I packed things in her bag that she would need because she didn't think we were going on a big trip. You had to think about those things, man. So that she would feel secure as we left. And for many years, it's not anymore, not to our 20th anniversary, for many years, that was the best trip of our life because our marriage needed the investment. It needed it. You gotta spend meaningful time together, display acts of kindness, leave a random note, shoot a random text, buy a favorite drink or bring it home, pick up a snack or a meal they love. Pick up the house in the way you normally wouldn't. Clean their car, so many things. Forgive offenses. Display compassion by being forgiving. Luke chapter 17, it says, chap chapter 17, verse one, it says, it is impossible that no offense should come. What's that mean? They're gonna come. That doesn't mean you have to take offense. Every time your spouse offends you, doesn't mean you have to take offense. You could actually give them mercy and you could forgive them. I'm not saying be walked over. I'm not saying be mistreated. I'm not saying those things. But sometimes we take offense over the dumbest, littlest things. They come into my office and, and I'll be talking about what's going on and they'll tell me it was all because of this little tiny thing. I'm like, that is not why you're here today. Yeah, he needs to start treating you better, but it's not about that. Quit taking offense over that thing. Develop relational maintenance. These people that were, had 545% more flourishing than anybody else, they said, my partner's quick to forgive me when I make mistakes, and they said, we work on our relationships and tell each other what we need. Do a devotional, go to a seminar, do a retreat, go take a trip, have some intentional focus. If you're stingy, save up and buy something special for your spouse. If you're busy, intentionally make time in the calendar for your spouse. Cancel something important to prioritize their spouse. Those who are not great with words, muster up courage to share words of affirmation and encouragement and thankfulness with their spouse. I want to tell you one more story. I know we're late. I want to share one more story. So a few years ago, um, the church was going to get an award. I don't even know why. I, we were going to get an award at, I don't know, like a chamber meeting. They were going to present to us some sort of award for something we've been doing. It happened to be on my wife's birthday. And like a good man, I said, hey, hey, there's... A, and it was going to be, you know, down at the Unis Center, which means a very nice meal. It was all going to be taken care of. It was going to be free for us to go. Hey, the church is supposed to get, the, get an award. Let's go, instead of going out to eat somewhere, let's let that be our meal. How do you think that went over? <laughs> my, my wife, Melody, says, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't, I want to do that. And you have to understand, in my life, it's easy for the church to take that seat over my spouse. It's pretty easy. Your text, your phone calls, your whatever. And here we were going to be honored. She's like, no, I don't want to do that. 
Well, instead of me communicating and telling her, okay, we won't, I went ahead and made other plans for her birthday. And I'd actually asked Brian Bontz to go, hey, can you go receive this award for us? And can you do this? And sure. And I went home that night at five o'clock. It was on a Thursday. Went home that night and, um, and she was sitting around in sweats. And we always go out for our birthdays. I said, hey, let's, let's, it's your birthday, let's go out. She goes, I don't want to go to that banquet. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you're an idiot, Mitch. You're supposed to communicate. <laughs> I said, oh, honey, I heard you the other day. I got somebody else to go. I'm not going to go. And she knows for me that she just figured Mitch is just going to go because, you know, that's the right thing to do, go to the church. Do the church thing first. I said, no, that's not what I want to do. She got changed pretty fast. I realized there are times where I put work ahead of my spouse and I cheat. Don't cheat on your spouse by denying the compassion they need. When they run out emotionally and they're taking things out on you, extend mercy. When their needs are overbearing and they're looking for time and attention, give grace. When they're frustrated because the pressures of life are causing them not to be fully themselves, give mercy and grace. Be committed, be compassionate, be spouse-centered. In other words, when your marriage becomes less about me and more about them, you'll have the highest life satisfaction and life meaning. Why don't you stand with me? Proverbs 29.2 says, When the righteous flourish, the people rejoice. When your marriage flourishes, it will be a light to the world. It'll be a representation of the covenant relationship with God. Listen, I know some of you in this room, you've gone through brokenness. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to dig up old wounds. But I do believe God can heal you from that. I know some of you are lonely and you're isolated. I have compassion for you today. I care about you. I know it's hard. Some of you in this room, you're looking to be married one day. I want to encourage you to put the right principles in place in your life. Some of you have been married for a while and you stop being spouse-centered. You stop being committed. You stop displaying compassion. You've been cheating on your spouse. Heavenly Father, I pray today. All I can say, God, is we need your help. We're a mess. <laughs> we need your help, Lord. There's past experiences we've had that are still defining us. Lord, would you help us to find the help to get freedom from that? Lord, give us compassion to know and understand what our spouse has been through at the same time. Lord, for some of us, our present circumstances, we just need some help and guidance. Lord, show us where we haven't been committed. Show us where we haven't been giving compassion. Show us where we've been selfish. Lord, we have a picture in our mind of a future hope and dream of what marriage could look like. Lord, I don't know if we'll ever get there. I don't know if it'll ever have all of the flair that we think it needs. But Lord, would you help us take one step toward it? Lord, speak to our hearts individually today. Lord, help us get our eyes off of what we're not getting from our spouse. Help us to think about ourselves. How can we display better commitment? How can we be other-centered in our marriage? And how can we be compassionate? Holy Spirit, you're a great teacher. Would you help us with that today? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank the Lord for his word today. Even as hard as that was, you can still thank him for it. I know that was hard. Listen, as you leave today, as you leave today, there'll be people that pray with you down front. There's also an event that's happening in a week, not tomorrow, the week after. Big Igloo Adventures, John Michael Hinton. He is a professional illusionist. We're going to have an outreach event down at the Merriman Theater. It's all free for families. You're going to get an invitation when you leave. Would you invite somebody to come to that? Not this Monday. Next Monday, would you invite them to come to be part of that so that we can love our community using this event? Drop your connection cards, your offerings on the way out. Be blessed. Have a great day.